Okay, aerobic respiration in eukaryote. So uh, I'm going to have a mitochondria. So you know it's in eukaryote and it's going to require oxygen. So aerobic respiration definitely is going to require oxygen. Okay, so there's three steps, three parts to this. And the first part is actually just outside the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. Okay, so step one is glycolysis. And this step is exactly what it looks like. Glyco sugar lysis break. So we take a six carbon molecule, glucose. You see glucose has six carbon, so we take a six carbon molecule, glucose, and we break it apart into two three carbon molecules. Okay, so this is G3P, but then it turns into or it eventually becomes pyruvic acid. So it's essentially half of glucose. Okay, this process to, to break or to lyse glucose took two ATP. So I have a little minus two ATP right there. But when you broke the bond, you made four ATP. So we say there is a net of two ATP and it makes two NAD pluses become NADH. So they are reduced, gain electrons, to NADH. So these are electron carrier molecules. So you make two ATP and two NADPH. A couple things you want to know here. It occurred in the cytoplasm. This process did not require oxygen. And all organisms on Earth perform this. So all organisms perform this. It did not require oxygen. It happened in the cytoplasm, and you made two ATP and two NADPH in the first step of cellular respiration, which is glycolysis. Okay, the next step is the Krebs cycle, and it happens inside the mitochondria. Well, the mitochondria is a is an organelle that has a cristae inside it. And cristae is inner folds. It increases the surface area of the mitochondria. So this is the cristae of the mitochondria. Okay, so the second step we call the Krebs cycle. And I'm drawing it inside the cristae because that's where it occurs. Krebs cycle, also citric acid cycle, that's what it can be called, is inside the cristae. Well, these pyruvic acids or pyruvates have to get inside the mitochondria and they can only do so with oxygen. So now, from now on, inside the mitochondria we need oxygen. Well, in order to do that, this pyruvic acid has to become Acetyl-CoA, which is a two-carbon molecule. Okay, so this is acetyl-coenzyme-A. Okay, well, acetyl-coenzyme-A now will start the Krebs cycle, and it's going to go through a series of steps, and it's going to bind with a molecule and break, mole break off and bind and break off. One of the intermediate molecules is called citric acid. I, I'm listing that molecule only because the Krebs cycle could also be called the citric acid cycle, and that's why. Well, then the citric acid gets broken down, and we end up right where we started. So that's why this one is what we call a cycle. This process happens, happens two times for every molecule of glucose because there's two pyruvates have to do it. So there's two pyruvates, so the citric acid cycle has to occur twice. The citric acid cycle makes two total ATP, so right here we'll write it, two ATP, six NADH, remember those are electron molecules, two FADH, this is another electron molecule, we're going to talk about its function, but it carries electrons, and four CO2. And these numbers are just average, um, averages based off 
one molecule of glucose, but it depends on what you break in down and what organism you are. Okay, so the, we've made two ATP, which is not very much, but we've made these electron molecules that are important. And the CO2, this is the CO2 that you exhale. You also lost the CO2 right here from the pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. This step is called the pyruvate conversion. This is called the Krebs cycle. Okay, next step, which is the most important, I think, is called the electron, so step three, electron transport chain. Okay, the electron transport chain is a phospholipid bilayer on the cristae. So this is a this is a phospholipid bilayer right here. So I'm gonna draw me some phospholipids. And these should look familiar. Just like what the cell membrane's made out of. Running out of room here. Okay, so this funny looking protein at the end is ATP synthase. So ATP synthase. And it does just what it sounds like it does. It makes ATP. I'm gonna draw another one right here. Okay. The NADH and SADH carry electrons to the electron transport chain. So NADH and SADH, and then also this NADH, are going to carry electrons to the electron transport chain. Okay, so NADH is going to drop off its electrons, so it's going to lose an electron. It's going to be oxidized. And when it does, the electron is going to go through the electron transport chain, and NADH becomes NAD+. So the NADH is just freed of its electrons. The electrons go through the chain. NAD+, is left, and that can go back over here to glycolysis or the Krebs cycle to, get, to pick up more electrons. So this just shuttles electrons to the electron transport chain. So the electrons go down through the chain. As the electrons go through the chain, protons, uh, hydrogen protons actually, are popped up through these proteins. So these are proteins, these are phospholipids. Hydrogen molecules are popped up. Okay, well, so as electrons go through, more hydrogens are created. And the hydrogens are coming from in here. So those hydrogens are created and it builds up a gradient, almost like when you blow up a balloon. They're, it's full of hydrogens. And notice I've drawn this in between the cristae and the mitochondria because that's where it's happening at. So the outer membrane space, or out, outside the cristae, well these hydrogens have to go somewhere. So the hydrogens go through this special enzyme called ATP synthase. ATP synthase makes synthase. ATP. So as the hydrogens go down through here, they're actually brought back in the cristae. As the hydrogens go down through, ATP synthase turns, and as ATP synthase turns, it makes ATP. So ATP is created as, those, as that hydrogen gradient, the concentration gradient of hydrogens goes down through ATP synthase. It's made from ADP. So adenosine diphosphate plus a phosphate. That's called phosphorylation to make an ATP. Uh, roughly 32 to 34, depending on the organism and what we broke down. Okay, so this step, um, we've taken a molecule and we've oxidized it, lost electrons, and we've made ATP. So another word for that is oxidative. So this ETC is also referred to as oxidative phosphorylation because NADH was oxidized and we made ATP so we phosphorylated ADP into ATP. Um, one thing I did not mention yet is the SADH. 
Okay, FADH, just like NADH, drops off electrons. The difference is it drops off the electrons right here, where NADH dropped its off right here. So the FADH is going to drop off electrons closer to ATP synthase. So not as many hydrogens come from the FADH electrons, so it doesn't make as much ATP. FADH makes a roughly two ATP, while NADH makes three ATP. But they both carry two electrons. The difference is the number of hydrogens that come up because of the location where the electrons are put. So FADH is it's after the first molecule. It's actually onto this lipid right here. Or NADH is way back here. Okay, so I said that this was called oxidative. You're oxidizing an or a molecule. Oxidative phosphorylation. These two processes are referred to as substrate level phosphorylation. You are breaking a substrate. You're breaking glucose, you're breaking citric acid, you're breaking a substrate, breaking a substrate and making ATP. So phosphorylation is making ATP. So glycolysis and the Krebs cycle are substrate level phosphorylation, while the electron transport chain is oxidative phosphorylation. Also, one thing I want to note, this is active transport, this pumping of hydrogens. And then as the hydrogens go from high concentration to low concentration, it's passive transport. So this active transport working with passive transport is what we call chemiosmosis. And that chemiosmosis is how ATP is actually made, the active transport and the passive transport. And this is the three steps that occur with oxygen. If there isn't oxygen, then then the pyruvates never enter into the mitochondria. So without oxygen, it's only glycolysis because these two require oxygen. Um, in animal cells, we take the glucose, and we break it into the two pyruvates, and the pyruvates are transferred without oxygen into lactic acid. So these pyruvates are transferred into lactic acid, and that frees up the NADH and makes it become NAD plus again. So pyruvates make lactic acid, and when this is freed, it starts glycolysis again. So without oxygen, we only do glycolysis, um, and that's why we get sore muscles after we work out, because you don't have enough oxygen in your muscles to go into the Krebs cycle. So your body does makes lactic acid in a process called lactic acid fermentation. Okay, some organisms like yeast, instead of they make the pyruvates, but instead of making lactic acid, they make alcohol. So they make the ethanol alcohol. And the same thing happens. The pyruvates make alcohol, and the alcohol frees up the NADH. So it's NAD plus, and that's going to start glycolysis over again. The only difference is the pyruvates become ethanol, and it releases CO2 as a byproduct. That's what makes bread rise, the CO2. So you've got lactic acid in, in animals, and you've got alcohol fermentation in some bacteria and yeast.